This week we come to a verse in the Bible that has probably been misquoted, misapplied, misunderstood, misused, and abused more than almost any other verse in the Bible. Well, that's a great opener, isn't it? <laughs> been misused, misunderstood, abused more than most any other verse in the Bible. It is Philippians 4, verse 13. Some of you may know that verse by heart. Can anybody say it? Philippians 4, 13. If I start it, I bet you can finish it. There you go, Matt. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. How many have ever memorized that verse? How many have ever taken an encouragement in that verse? Or, or you've uh, heard that verse, at least. That verse is nearly identical, I noticed, in almost every translation of the Bible when you read it. Even John 3.16 is a little bit different from different translations, but this one, pretty much all of them say, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. It is a verse that has brought encouragement to numerous people, and it has such a positive message to it. Don't you find hope in those words? But it doesn't really mean what people often seem to think it means. I, I, I say that, and all I can think of is Princess Bride. You know, there's that point where the little guy keeps saying, inconceivable. And, and the, the Spaniard is there with him, and finally he says, inconceivable. And he says, there's that word again. I don't think you know what that word means. A lot of people are like that with this very verse. It, it brings us encouragement, but a lot of people really don't know what it really means, and that's what we're going to be looking at today. People will take that verse to mean you can do anything and be anything you set your mind to do as long as you just believe. And there is nothing beyond your grasp. There's nothing you can't do. There's nothing you can't become. And so we'll, we'll put that on bumper stickers. You put it on that little card that you stick up on your mirror, that you look in in the mirror, and I'm going to make it. I can do anything through Christ who strengthens me. That is basically the theme of every athletic movie ever made. Have you noticed that? It's always the guy who can't make the cut who ends up being the hero. That is the theme of all of them. I love those movies. Now, don't get me wrong. There's a, there's a lot of encouragement and motivation in those movies. I think of Hoosiers. How many seen Hoosiers? How many like Hoosiers? Lisa loves Hoosiers. I get a little bored with it. But <laughs> what's interesting, though, our church in Indiana that we had there, that opening scene where they drive through that little town, that's right around the corner from where our church was. And I used to ride my bike past that, that opening scene all the time. And people in our church met uh, Gene Hackman there, said he was a real nice guy and all that while they were filming that. But, so it was filmed right near our church. We had, uh, the movie Rudy, I mean, I've seen that. Oh, that's a good one. Uh, uh, Lisa and I watched one just the other night, and I recommend this. I don't often recommend movies, because as soon as I do, there's probably something in it I didn't know was in it. You're like, the pastor watches movies like that? So I'm very careful. But this movie I will recommend. It's called, was it called Greater? Greater. It is a Christian movie. It is on Netflix. I believe that's where we found it. Yes, it is on Netflix. So it's one of the good things on Netflix, and they're getting fewer and farther between but it's called Greater, and I, re I would recommend watching it. It is a Christian movie. It was a really good one. Uh, the movie Woodlawn. How many have seen that? That's a Christian one, too, that's really good. So all those do motivate us. And when I was going through these movies, I noticed there's these interesting trends. Two of those star Sean Astin. <laughs> Two of those movies do, and uh, who happens to be a Christian. And uh, three of them have ties to Indiana. So it's like, well, maybe that's all there is to do in Indiana is make motivational films or something like that. But there's not a lot to do other than sports, so people get pretty excited about those. But anyway, as we watch these movies, the unfortunate thing is we forget that those movies are what we call exceptions to the norm. When the little guy makes it to the big chance, and he makes the team, and he saves the day. If it was the norm, we would be bored with these movies because there would be nothing exceptional about them. If everybody who determined to go out and make the team and be the best player on the team could go out and make the team and be the best player on the team, it should be an interesting thing if every player is the best player on the team, there would be nothing exceptional and it would be boring. They are exceptions to the rule and it's, it's just no amount of motivation sometimes can overcome my obstacles to doing the things I want to do. And so my point is that that verse is not saying that. We take the same uh, logic and sense of hype and we tell our kids that when they're growing up that you can be anything you want to be. Now, I'm not saying go home and shatter your kids' dreams, okay? 
Trust me, you're never going to be that. That's not what I'm saying either, so don't do that. But unfortunately, it just isn't true that your kid, I know your kid is the best kid who ever lived, the smartest, the brightest, most athletic, but it just isn't true, <laughs> no matter what the bumper stickers say. You know, I myself, I always wanted to be an astronaut. I always wanted to be an astronaut when I was a little kid, and, and you know, you can be anything you want. I built models of spaceships all the time. In my bedroom as a kid, I had uh, an X-Wing fighter, and I did something really cool. I built it, this plastic model. When, did they even have those anymore? I don't see them uh, anywhere anymore. But, and I would take snap and pops and hit it, and it had little blast marks on it, which looked really cool. I had Darth Vader's TIE fighter in there. I, I actually had the Millennium Falcon, which was big. That was a cool one, and uh, not that those are real spaceships, but I had the Eagle Lander from Space 1999. Nobody even knows what that show is. But I also had, this was cool, I had the Apollo Soyuz mission. How many remember that? When the Russians and the United States docked two ships for the, well, Soviet Union and the United States docked two ships up in space in orbit for the first time, which has led to all this cooperation we've had in space since. And I had a model of that hanging in my room. I loved space. I wanted to be an astronaut until somebody told me that flying in space is just like riding a roller coaster. And I don't like roller coasters. I don't like falling. You know, I'll swim as deep as I can go, but I don't like falling. And they told me, yeah, it feels just like you're falling all the time. So eight-year-old me had to refigure his whole career path at that point. You can't do anything you want and become anything you want. That is not what the verse is telling us. Now, not to be a Debbie Downer, but there just are limitations that are beyond my abilities. There are things I will never be. I will never be six foot five and 175 pounds. It's not going to happen. So that is not what that verse is telling us, even though it gets used that way all the time. And Paul will help us understand uh, all of this as we see this verse in its context this morning. It's a wonderful verse, an encouraging verse, but it's not the golden ticket to all of our dreams. So let's take out our Bibles. Let's turn to Philippians chapter 4. We are nearing the end of this study. Philippians chapter 4, reading verses 10 through 13. Philippians 4, 10 through 13. And I will ask you to stand with me in respect to God's word. Philippians chapter 4. I'm starting at verse 10. I'm reading from the English Standard Version. This is what it says. Paul writes to them, I rejoiced greatly, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low. And I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. You can be seated. In this passage, Paul is taught, that we've been going through here, Paul has taught us a lot about peace. He started out teaching us about being at peace with each other and about getting along. Then he taught us after peace with each other, he taught us how to have peace within. And uh, first he started out with the picture of peace, what it looks like, what the world needs to see in us. And then he talked about the path to peace. That's where we were last week. Well, this week he is going to teach us about the product of peace. So the peace within, we had the picture of peace, the path to peace, and now the product of peace. What does peace produce in my life? That's the question. Or if, if you, you love math, think of it this way. 
You, you know the product of two numbers is what you get when you multiply two numbers together, right? I mean, it's been a long time since most of us have had a math class, but that's what the product is. If you multiply A times B, the product is C, what they equal. So two times three, the product is? Good, especially for a daylight savings time Sunday, right? <laughs> 50 times 100, let's get a little tougher, see if the caffeine's working yet. 5,000, oh, you guys are smart. You guys are a smart bunch of people. That is the product, yeah, 5,000 is the product of 50 times 100, I can't even say it. Two weeks ago, Paul told us that by refusing to be anxious about things and taking everything to the Lord by prayer and supplication with what? Thanksgiving, very good, we get the peace of God. Last week, he told us that if we will set our minds on things that draw us closer to God, we will have the God of peace. Paul likes to play with words like that. He flipped those around on purpose. Well, the question is, what happens when we put those two things together? When we put the peace of God together with the God of peace, what is the product that we get? It is this explosive power to carry us through life. When I combine the peace of God with the God of peace, it's like nitroglycerin. I got to tell you a story. Did you ever do anything really stupid when you were a kid? Or am I alone? Okay. Okay. Good. I'm glad I'm not. Well, this was extremely stupid. We were in our AP chemistry class, seniors in high school, and my, my lab partner, we were curious kind of guys, and we were doing an experiment that required nitric acid, and so we had this bottle of nitric acid in our lab, and we looked over and we saw this bottle of glycerin sitting over on the teacher's death. De not death, no, desk, not death. And it could have been, but we saw the glycerin there, and we thought, let's make some nitroglycerin. <laughs> Told you it was dumb. And, and he said, yeah, if, if you get the bottle, I'll mix them together. It was toga day of homecoming week, so I had on this dark blue toga, and I walked up by the teacher's desk, and I just took the bottle of glycerin and shoved it in my toga, walked back to the lab, and we mixed them together when he left the room. And then we saw it start changing colors and stuff. We're like, oh no, it's reacting. And we panicked, and we shoved it in our drawer, slammed the drawer shut, and, and hoped nobody ever opened it. <laughs> and we're thinking, this is really bad. So a couple weeks go by, and we're like, we got to get that out of there somehow before somebody gets killed. And, and, and so we're, we're waiting for the opportunity. It seemed like for those two weeks, the chemistry teacher would never leave the room, right? But we needed him to leave the room so we could get this possibly explosive compound out of the drawer. And it's a really old school. We were up on the second floor. Unfortunately, it was, it was spring, so the windows were open because we didn't have air conditioning back then in the schools. And you just sweat it and stuck to your desk, right? That's the way it worked. And, and finally, the teacher left the room. And we're like, okay, we got to get this. And we go over and we slide the drawer open as carefully as we can. We take out this tube that now had goo in it. And we're like, the window. And so we run to the window, and we throw it out the window, and everybody's covering their ears and things, and it just goes on the sidewalk. So the building's still standing, and we're still alive. So fortunately, we didn't know enough about chemistry to make it work. <laughs> but it was, it was just one of those dumb things. We wanted to make nitroglycerin because it's such a powerful thing. Well, he is saying, we, we see this when we take the God of peace and we put it with the peace of God. We get this explosive compound that is like nitroglycerin for our lives other than it works. With all of Paul's talk and his focus on things like the nature of Christ and the mind of Christ and growing in Christ and talking about peace that we've been seeing over the past couple months, it would be easy to forget Paul's circumstances under which he is writing this letter. We talked about it at the beginning. Let's see if you remember. Where is Paul while he's writing this letter? A little louder? Prison. Prison, yes. I thought I heard several of you say it. Yes, he is writing this letter from prison, chained to a guard, maybe two guards. He is responsible for all his own care at that time. It wasn't like prison today. You didn't get three hots in a cot. You had to take care of yourself. You're chained in there, and if you're going to survive, it's because somebody else is sending stuff into you and taking care of you. You were responsible for all that. He had a physician with him. 
He was in, getting older, and he had a doctor with him. Anybody remember the doctor's name? Luke, yes. If, if you look at uh, 2 Timothy 4.11, uh, I don't have a slide for you right now, but he says, Luke alone is with me. That's the last, thing he, last letter he writes, the last chapter he writes, and says, only Luke is with me now. Because he'd sent the others on errands, like delivering these letters that we're studying. And whatever he had to live off was whatever these churches that we're reading about were sending him for his support. And that brings us to verse 10. Look down at verse 10. He says, I rejoiced greatly in the Lord that now at length you have revived your concern for me. I don't think this was the disciplined kind of rejoicing that we talked about two weeks ago when he says, I rejoiced greatly in the Lord. We talked about that disciplined kind of rejoicing where we're facing hardship, but we say, nevertheless, I will rejoice and I will live in joy. He's not talking about that one. I think here when he says, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, he's talking about that genuine belly laugh kind of rejoicing that comes when you are overwhelmingly thrilled with something and you just can't hold it in. I think Paul was hooping it up and dancing around his prison cell when he got this little package from them. He was there and it was cold and it was uncomfortable in his prison cell. And a guard shows up at the bars with a visitor and the visitor is carrying uh, goods like food and clothes and money to help him survive. I remember a time in Bible school, uh, when Lisa and I were in Bible school, the church I grew up in would send us these little checks now and again. There was a, a senior citizens group there. They were called the Keenagers. And they would send out these little, like, $10 checks to the college students, like, once every couple months or something. I remember how excited I would be, because it would mean I could go down to the, the, the bookstore, the campus bookstore, and buy study tools and stuff like that. But there was one time it meant even more. There was a time right after we had our oldest son, and, and we were, like, starving. We, we were destitute. But we didn't go around telling everybody. We saw people on campus all the time. They would go up and they'd say, yeah, I got a prayer request. I, uh, Lord Jesus, you know I have this bill for $595.23, and if I don't get it paid this week, if some loving soul does not feel motivated by your spirit to give me this money, then I'm going to be kicked out of, of school. We didn't do that. We kept our mouths shut about how it was. Because we want to see God move. And he did. It was so wonderful. We were there and we were like just starving. And, you know, because the baby gets everything. <laughs> you know, we, well, we weren't totally starving, but it felt like it. We were, there was plenty of macaroni and cheese and that's what we lived off, right? Uh, ramen noodles and mac and cheese. And uh, so anyway, that's the way we were living. But we were really out of money that month. And then there was this knock on the door. And there was an older student who, he was settled in life. He came in, and he was carrying two bags of groceries. And we literally, we cried. I mean, to have that food dropped off. Uh, you know, um, Jiffy corn muffins never tasted so good. I still like Jiffy corn muffins, but, but they tasted so good that time. And, and it was a time to rejoice because we had food again. Which, this is a great lesson for us, just to know how much a small act of kindness can mean to somebody who's receiving it. Paul rejoiced greatly. The next phrase always struck me a little bit when I read this. He says, now at length, you have revived your concern for me. That seems to almost bear this negative context as I'm reading this. Now at length, I mean, you finally got around to caring about me is kind of what it sounds like. Most of the translations, uh, other translations word it this way. He says, but I rejoice greatly in the Lord that now at last you have revived your concern for me. Like Paul was worried that they had forgotten about him sitting there rotting in his prison cell after all these people had meant to him. We saw how he called him my joy and my crown and how much I long to be with you, but thinking that they had forgotten about him. And I read that and I think how we forget how human these people in the Bible that we're reading about really were. Sometimes we just forget about that and we think like they all just hovered above the ground and they weren't touched with the things that we are. But we need to not do that because that can minimize the way God can use us. When we realize that these people in these stories, in these books, are people exactly like us. Turn with me over to the book of James, chapter 5, verse 17. 
James 5, verse 17. James writes this, Elijah, remember what Elijah did? Call down fire from heaven, stop rain for three and a half years. It says, Elijah was as human as we are. King James says he was subject to like passions as we are. Everything we feel, he felt. Everything we experience, he experienced. He was a person just like us, James says. And yet when he prayed earnestly that no rain would fall, none fell for three and a half years. We look back at these stories and we think, yeah, but I'm not Elijah. He got it to quit raining for three and a half years. And then James tells us what? He's just like us. And God answered his prayers. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8. Turning our gaze back to Paul. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8. We forget how human Paul was. And he writes this in his second letter to the Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 1, verse 8, he says, For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia, for we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Can you imagine the Apostle Paul being like that? Timothy, I don't think I can go on another day. Barnabas, I, I think this is the end. I can't make it any further. Despairing of life. That's not the way we think of the apostle, but we have to remember he was a person just like us. It is likely that Paul felt that way at some point sitting in that prison cell as if he'd been forgotten and was on his own. But then this gift showed up from these people he knew, and he loved them, and they loved him, and this gift came through to help him. And it was just like the lights came on. He's in this dark prison cell, and it's cold, and he's hungry, and he doesn't have any clean clothes, and he doesn't have any soap, and this gift comes through, and it was like a light came down, and you could hear Etta James singing like only she can, at last, you know. This gift came through. That's what it's like. The verses are like there. At last, you have revived your concern for me. He was so excited. He was rejoicing greatly in the Lord. And I, I say he isn't criticizing them or complaining that it, it took time for this to happen. He makes that clear in his next comment. He says, indeed, you were concerned for me, and I know you were, but you lacked opportunity. They wanted to help him. They wanted to do things, but they weren't what? Able to. He wanted to clarify his remark about their concern for him. He knew deep down inside that they were concerned, but his circumstances were probably making it hard to see. Do your circumstances ever make it hard for you to see what's really going on? Do your circumstances maybe make it hard for you to see other people are caring for you? He probably hadn't had a text or an email from them in a long time. Can you imagine living in a time when you can't just text and email everybody? Our daughter, you know, she's the missionary in Paris, and we can just any time, just on WhatsApp, send her something free, and we can talk back and forth. It wasn't always that way. It wasn't all that long ago that it wasn't that way. I remember in 2001, while I was in Africa, and Lisa and the kids were back here, I would have to go. I was in Lagos, Nigeria, and I'm walking down the street, and man, was I getting the stares. I probably shouldn't have been walking around alone in Lagos, Nigeria, the only white guy for anywhere around, and people were looking out windows and vehicles at me and shouting things to me. But I wanted to send a message to Lisa. And the only way I could do that is to go down the street and find an internet cafe and go in and pay money to actually send an email. It wasn't all that long ago. Well, he hadn't heard from them. They, they, he was there feeling like he's alone in the cell. So of course he was getting down about it. Interestingly, the word he used for revive here, though, gives us a clue that he knew they still cared. It's a beautiful picture word where he says revived. He didn't use the word revived, which means to be raised from the dead. It's not that their concern was dead for him. He used a word that quite literally means that a new sprig of life has appeared like on a plant. 
I went out to our woodshed the other day. I got to see this firsthand. I went out to refill our rack of wood inside, and I have a woodshed at the house, and I was carrying in this firewood, and we keep our rose bushes in there during the winter so they don't freeze and die, right? And they're in there in this dark room, and I was totally surprised. I came in and told Lisa, I said, your roses are coming back to life. Well, they weren't dead. They were dormant, and these little sprigs of green are starting to pop out on the ends, even though it's still cold, still snowing, <laughs> And they're locked in this dark room, but you're seeing this new growth come on there. And that's exactly the word he uses here. It's a beautiful picture that he's just saying, I just looked and I saw this beautiful little sprig of life come out. And it tells me spring is on the way and gives me hope. This is an astounding, astoundingly personal letter from Paul to these people, isn't it? That he's sharing all these feelings. He knew that they loved him and were concerned. He knew that they were not, he knew if they were not sending him something, that something had to be stopping them from sending it. And he backed all this up by saying, I'm not saying this out of need. I want you to understand that what I'm saying to you now is not about the need itself. Need there is an uh, absolute destitution and poverty. But he's saying to them, that's not the case. It's not that I just have to have what you can give. He probably was in absolute destitution and poverty in that cell, unable to earn a living for himself or provide for himself in any way. He's not saying he didn't need the gift. What he is saying is that the love behind the gift that they sent, however large or however small it was, meant much, much more than the gift itself. Because it said we care. Next, Paul opens up about the crux of this whole section. He says, I'm not saying this out of need. He says, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. That is the product of peace. To be able to live and be okay no matter what our life's circumstances are is the product of peace. That is what made it possible for him to tell them that the gift was good and the gift was needed, but what really mattered to them was that they were concerned for him. We will see this in the next passage of this book. We'll see in the next passage of the book that what they sent may not have been all that much money because we will see that they were actually very poor, these Philippians. They weren't uh, boiling over with money or anything like that. And we'll see how they gave supernaturally, and it's a wonderful thing we'll be looking at. But it didn't matter to Paul because he was okay. And he knew it. He knew he would be okay in whatever circumstances he was. So now he could say, it's not about the gift. It's about your care for me. Look at verse 11. There's a power word there. I just read that verse. But there's a power word there that sums up Paul's ability to live at peace no matter what his circumstances are. So put on your Bible study caps. And you tell me, what is that power word in verse 11? Nope, that wasn't it. <laughs> Content, yes. It's a powerful, powerful word. Content. Contentment is the product of peace. Contentment is the product of peace. Paul lists, uh, it will carry us through anything and everything, and Paul lists any and everything in verse 12 there. He says, I know how to be brought low. I know how to abound in any and every circumstance. There it is right there. I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I know how to be brought low. Other translations say, I know how to live humbly. Here's, here's something for you, some food for thought. Did you know... The word humble was a derogatory word in Paul's time. We have elevated it to this, this moral thing that we want to achieve, but in the world he's writing in, the world humble was a derogatory term. It is never used as an honorable term in an honorable sense prior to the New Testament in any literature out there. Isn't that interesting? The word humble 
was not considered a good thing until the New Testament came into the world. When Paul wrote back in chapter 2, verse 8, where we were, that Jesus humbled himself, well, as these Gentiles were reading that book, it had a very, uh, that word, it had a very negative connotation to, to it. The Muslim world to this day cannot accept that God would humble himself and take on that kind of status like that, let alone be born of a woman and go through all these things. God would never allow his son to do that, they say, so Jesus can't possibly be the son of God. It's one of the things they believe. In fact, they don't believe that God would allow Jesus to be crucified, so they believe that Simon of Cyrene was crucified in his place, and Jesus kind of sidestepped it. It's what they believe, because God would not allow Jesus to be crucified, is to humiliating. Paul uses a humble in the context here of the Gentile understanding. I know how to be humble, dirt poor, destitute, looked down on, despised. I know how to be that way. Then he says, I know how to, what does he say next? I know how to be humble. I know how to abound. I know how to abound. It is, it, it's nice to live, isn't it, in a time of life when you can pay your bills comfortably and not worry about it, where you're not always worrying about where the next gas bill is going to be paid or how you're going to keep food on the time. You can get to this point where life gets more comfortable, and it's nice that you don't have to worry about these things. Well... That's not what Paul's talking about when he says abound. When Paul says abound here, he is talking about having more money, not only just paying your bills, but you have more money than you can possibly think of what you're going to do with this money. And now your stress isn't that you can't pay the bills. The, the stress is, what am I going to do with all this money? How am I possibly going to spend all this money? If I asked you which one of those two problems you'd really rather have, how many would say, I'd rather have the humble problem and be poor? That's what I thought, <laughs> okay? I'd rather have more money than I can possibly think of how I'm going to spend all this money before I die than to worry about being poor. But the thing is, and what Paul's acknowledging here is that has challenges too. That has challenges too. Proverbs 30, verses 8 and 9 says this. Solomon wrote this, very wise. But if you're writing the Bible, you should be. It says, Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food that is needful for me, lest I be full and deny you and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. It says, God, keep me in the middle here. I don't want to be so rich that I don't think I need God, and I don't want to be so poor that I'm doing wrong things and shaming my God. Keep me right here in the sweet spot, God. There's challenges to both sides. But Paul says, I can do both. I can be totally destitute, or I can be rich beyond imagination because I'm content with whatever God gives me. It says, in any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. Any and every circumstance. There it is again. That is pretty, that's a pretty broad spectrum, isn't it? That's pretty all-inclusive. Any and all circumstances. Can you think of one thing that would fit outside of any and all circumstances? Of course not. There's nothing left out of it. But I love how he says it there. He says, I have learned the secret. I've learned the secret. He's making another play on words. Paul likes to make play on words, plays on words. I told you about the Gnostics that he was dealing with here with the Philippians and in the book of Colossians and in the book of Ephesians. He's dealing with them a lot in those three books. And the Gnostics who believed that there was this secret knowledge you could attain and it would make you more spiritual than other people and, and make you closer to God and make you a better person. That's what the Gnostics believed in this secret mystical knowledge you could attain if you follow only by following them of course you won't get it from Paul you got to get it from them and Paul plays a word game with them there with this 
Because the word he used for secret means a mysterious, secret, magic knowledge. Do you see what he's doing? He's taking what all these Gnostics are looking for over here, and he says, that's not really it. Here is the secret, mystical, magical knowledge. This works like magic, folks. I found the secret. These guys are running around and, and, and looking for all this secret magic, and I can sum it up for you in this one thing. Learn to be content with whatever God gives you in life. That's it, period. That's what he says. Can't be an astronaut? Learn to be content with the models in your room. Right? There's one I never got. One model I never got was the Jupiter 2 from Lost in Space. They still sell it. Don't tell Lisa. Because it's like this big. And I don't think she'll let me put it in the house. See? <laughs> if you look at my Amazon list, it's on there. <laughs> it's on there. So, so is the robot B9. What's that? I'm cool with that. <laughs> That's a cool model. But she's not going to let me have it at home. Learn to be content with it. <laughs> That's what Paul says. Whether you're rich and have more than you could ever spend, or whether you're poor and debased and cannot see how you're going to make it through tomorrow, learn to be what? Content with what? Whatever God gives you. It's magic. Let's have some fun here. I want you to name some of these any and every circumstances that Paul is talking about. In these circumstances, that you can be content with whatever God gives you. What are they? Give me some. What are some of these circumstances? What? Prison. prison. It's a good one. If you're in prison, yes, can you be content? Anything else? Illness. Illness. Good. What else? Shipwreck, he was that, yes. Beaten stone, shipwreck, and all that. How about some positives? Winning the lotto. I never buy tickets, so I'm probably never going to win the lotto, but... What's that? Bills all paid. Bills all paid. Oh, we should really be content with that. I'm, I don't mind paying the bills when I have the money. Have you ever noticed that? <laughs> yeah, get a large inheritance. Get, uh, uh, there's a stock market crash. Can you be content? There's a windfall on the stock market. Can you be content? The death of a loved one. Be content with what God gives you. God can see us through any and all of these things. Can you be content through all of these things? Any and all of them, as Paul says. In Paul's book, How to Be a Preacher, you probably know of it as 1 Timothy, he sums this whole concept up, especially for those who are going into public ministry. And so he's teaching this young uh, pastor, Timothy, a few things. And if you turn with me to the book of 1 Timothy, chapter 6, verses 6 through 10. 1 Timothy, in case I said second, 1 Timothy, chapter 6, verses 6 through 10. If you look for 2 Timothy 6, you're going to be looking for a long time. 1 Timothy, chapter 6. 6 through 10. Listen to what Paul writes to his young companion here. It says, But godliness with what? Contentment is great gain. It's the same as being rich. For we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of it. Well, that sure sums it up, doesn't it? But if we have food and clothing with these, we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is, what's it say? A root of all kinds of it. Yes, Ben Franklin got this one wrong. It's, he said, money is the root of all evil. Paul said, the love of money is the root of all. He says, it is through this 
craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs or many, we could even say pains, it's the same kind of thing, a pang of hunger or something, you're, you're wanting to eat, you're never satisfied is what he is saying there because you're not content. True wealth is being content with whatever God has given you in any and every circumstance, like magic. Discontentment, on the other hand, is a lack of thankfulness, as we saw in Philippians 4, 6 a couple weeks ago, and that will cut us off from the peace of God and will leave us with anxiety. When he said, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, well, discontentment is a lack of gratitude for what he has done for us. Peace is or excuse me, contentment is the expression of peace. Peace is the expression of trusting God. Thanksgiving is the expression of contentment. If you're content, you will be thankful. Peace is the expression of trusting God like Jesus did in the back of the boat on a pillow napping in the middle of a storm. That leads us right back to where we started and gives us the full expression of Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. The phrase I can do all things there is really, I have the strength to bear up under any load. I have the strength to bear up under any load. I have strength sufficient to the task at hand. This is what's on my plate, and I have the strength to take care of this thing. I may never be an astronaut, and I'm pretty sure by this time that's out. Lisa made me ride this ride at Dollywood. I call it Satan slingshot. Man, I told her I didn't want to ride that thing. My throat hurt from the screaming like a little girl up there, you know. The astronaut thing's pretty well out. <laughs> Bad memories just went through. I'm having chills here, you know. It may never be an astronaut. I'm pretty sure that's out at this point. But I will bear up under whatever load life dumps on me at this point. Why? Because I have peace with God. I have the peace of God. And I have the God of peace, and I will bear up, because he will give me strength. Now, there, there's something, this is something we really should be teaching our young people, don't you think? Our children and young people, to learn to be content with where God has them in life and what he gives them in life. Not that they shouldn't aspire, and I'm not saying that. I'm not saying go home and crush their dreams. But we need to teach them to be content as well. Uh, Lisa and I were walking through Meyer getting some groceries the other night, and she showed me a thing on the end cap. It was the, I can do anything, Barbie. <laughs> I can do anything, Barbie. Well, or no, it was the be anything, Barbie. That was it. Be anything, Barbie on the end cap. And I thought, you know, I bet the I can do anything, Barbie might not be as pretty. <laughs> Might not have the nicest clothes or the perfect figure. She might have four kids hanging off her as she's trying to get groceries in the store. But I think she has a look of contentment on her face. And a look of determination that says, God can carry me through this. Where Paul says, him who strengthens me, that is a real key to this. That phrase, strengthen, means that God is literally, continually pumping explosive power into me. That sounds exciting, doesn't it? It actually has the word that we get the word dynamite, like maybe Paul tried to make nitroglycerin once or something like that, but no, that's not true. Um, don't take that home with you. But he's pumping this powerful, explosive power in me to help me Hold up under any load that comes my way. That is what Paul is saying. It's not my strength or my stamina that's going to get me through. It's not my willpower that's going to get me through. It is literally his, and he is injecting me with this power to make it through. This is what happens when, we have the, when I have the God of peace in my life. He injects me with this. But we have to remember it's only when I am in him. Turn with me one more time. Book of John, chapter 15. John, chapter 15, looking at verse 5. John 
John 15, 5, Jesus says, I am the vine and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do what? Nothing. And not most things, but what? Nothing. Nothing. It is he who injects this power to bear up under the load of life in the peace of God. He's the one that gives me that. And that is the product of peace. The peace of God coupled with the God of peace in my life is like a one-two punch that puts down my opponent. It will see me through any and every circumstance. One more question. Does that mean God will take away all those circumstances that are worrying me? Let me hear that again, a little louder. No, correct. It does not mean that he will remove all the circumstances. You are correct. But it does mean that he will see me through whatever comes. And the beauty of it all is this. No matter what happens, because I have Jesus Christ, if the worst case in this scenario goes and I don't make it and I die, where do I go? Heaven, home to be with him. So what have I got to lose anyway? I believe this message was timely, even though we started this book a long time ago. Little did we know when we rolled on into 2021 that things would get worse than 2020, and then we roll on into 2022. Somewhere you're going to think it should turn around and start getting better. Of course, we know the plague is over, but I believe this was timely for the time we're living in, right when the world is on the edge of war and we have brothers and sisters holding church in subways to protect themselves from bombs, when inflation is skyrocketing, God's word opens up to us and says, you can be at peace in any and every circumstance that comes along because I will give you the strength to bear up under whatever you face like Jesus in the back of the boat, like Daniel in the lion's den, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace, our God will see us through whatever comes on, and we will have peace in the storm. As I stated a couple weeks ago, this will be just what the world needs to see in us. Not running around scared and panicking because of all the things we see going on. No, they need to see the picture of peace in us because we have the peace of God and we have the God of peace empowering us to make it through and they will see how he sustains us and that will draw them to him. Let's pray.